back to order. Uh, our next case is Mr. Shannon Touche. Mr. Touche, would you please introduce yourself and give us your DOC number? Yes, sir. Shannon Touche, 458-731. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Touche, let me explain our process to you. First, I'm going to read some information into the record, and then the board is going to conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, we will allow those persons who wish to have input to speak. Uh, currently, we have uh, speaking uh, on your behalf uh, is uh, Shakiba Touche, who is a family member, Marshall Thomas, who is uh, your attorney, uh, Joannette Dodson, who is your mother, and also uh, present but not speaking is Joseph Landix, Joe Zanders, Clara Zanders, Gerard Gibson, Karen Papillon, Sheila Hudson, Christopher Touche, April Jordan, Charlton Dodson, Laura Tucker, Shan Williams, Ronald Olivier, and Justin Singleton. Uh, speaking as well in opposition uh, is uh, Rosanna Shaw. There may be two Rosanna Shaws or two names. Twice here. Yes. Uh, and then Kimberly Betsavi. Uh, also uh, present but not speaking is Brian LeBlanc. At the end, you'll be allowed to make a brief statement before the board votes. Do you understand our process? Yes, sir. This is the matter of Shannon Touche. Uh, Mr. Touche's date of birth is September the 1st of 1980. Uh, he is classified as a first felony offender. Uh, he has a parole eligibility date of August the 6th of 2023. He's not eligible for good time. He is currently serving a life sentence on the charge of second degree murder, having been sentenced on August the 9th of 2002. Uh, Mr. Touche, is this information accurate? Yes, sir. Touche, your case has been assigned to Ms. Bonnie Jackson. She will begin our interview process. Would you please answer any questions she might have? Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Touche. How are you? I'm well, and you? Thank you, I'm fine. Uh, Mr. Touche, let's um, talk a little bit about um, some information about you, and then we'll talk about um, we'll talk about some of the things that you've done uh, since your incarceration. You're currently 42 years old. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And how long have you been incarcerated on this crime? 24 years and eight months. So, how old were you uh, when you involved in this crime? 17 years old. Um, so let's talk about what was going on at your life in your life um, when you were 17. Were you in school? No, ma'am. And you graduated? Well, I have obtained my GED. No, no. I mean, did you obtain your GED while you were out? No, ma'am. Talking about when this crime happened. No. Uh, you had not graduated from high school, is that correct? That's correct. Why not? I had quit school and started running with the wrong crowd. First, why did you quit school? Just got tired of it, I guess. Really no excuse. Tell me about your family life. Well, my father wasn't in my life. My mother raised and how many how many siblings do you have? I have one one sister and two brothers. Now where do you fall in age among your siblings? I'm the oldest. And um, when did you start having trouble? at home and, and in school? Basically, when once I got to high school. And I, why started, did you, uh, I, started, I started slacking. 
I got involved with the wrong crowd and just doing things that I wasn't supposed to do. And eventually uh, I, I failed ninth grade. And the next year I just quit totally. Uh, do you remember a program called Diamonds in the Rock? Yes, ma'am. Did you participate in that? Yes, ma'am. That was a pool. What grade were you in when you participated in that? I was in seventh or eighth grade. And that was a program uh, where they worked with kids who were having some issues in an effort to help them navigate their way through uh, the remainder of their educational process. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. You participated in that program for how long? Oh, maybe it was about six months or so. It was during, uh, I want to say, my seventh grade school year. And, and, and we have a letter uh, from the person who was behind that, that idea and said that you, you ex excelled once you got in there. It took a while to get you uh, acclimated and get you on the right track, but you excel and they had high hopes for you. So what happened? Uh, I backtracked. I didn't continue to exceed as I was and just as I've said, just being involved with the wrong people. Um, involved in drugs and alcohol use? I smoked marijuana. What else? That's it. Any alcohol? No, ma'am. Now, I want you to talk about your involvement uh, in this crime. How did you know the victim? Well, I worked there with my grandfather. Doing what? Uh, constructing a, a house that he was building on the side of a house he had. Okay, and how, how long were you working with your grandfather on that uh, project? Roughly about a year or so. so. How often would you see the victim? Often. So, fair to say, you kind of knew him. Yes, ma'am. So, how did how did that then turn into your being involved in this crime that led to him losing his life? Well, I was involved with two guys, my co-defendants, Reginald Bazir and Ronald Benson. And we talked about robbing. Well, and let's, I, let's, let's back up when you say we talked about, did, they, did those two uh, individuals know the victim? No, ma'am. So you have to have been the one who brought up the subject of robbing this man because you knew him and under the impression that he had something of value that you all take. Is that correct? That's correct. And why would why would you do that? I mean, what what motivated you to want to steal from this person that you knew? You were working with your grandfather, so obviously you were getting some form of income. So what what motivated you to think it was a good idea to rob someone? Well, to be honest with you, it, it stemmed from, you know, being, wanting to be down, so say, Want to be involved with the older guys, 
the peer pressure behind it. And really, it's, it's no excuse. I take full accountability for my actions. So what was your role in the crime? What did you do? Well, I brought them there with the expectations of a robbery. Okay. Well, describe, describe for us how everything happened. Well, myself and my co-defendant, Reginald Bazir and Ronald Benson, we went to Mr. Shaw's house with the intention of a robbery. Once we got there, no one was home. So we waited behind the home. So once they drove up, we we seen where Miss Rosanna walked to the door and was waiting on Mr. Shaw. And when he came out, he had grocery bags in his hand. And once we seen him, my co-defenders came out and started shooting and killed Mr. Shaw. Where were you? I was behind them. And once we went up to the steps of the door. My co-defendant told me to get the keys out of Mr. Shaw's pocket. I told him no. And he told Ms. Shaw to go get the keys. At this moment, I was just real unstable after witnessing this. And after she got the keys, they went in the house. You go in the house? No, ma'am, I did not. Once they went in the house, I can't tell you anything else that happened because I left and went and got in the car and didn't know exactly what to do. I know it was a lot of things I was supposed to do that I didn't do. And through this catastrophic event, I take full accountability for my actions. I brought them there. And with the intentions of a robbery, and and through this ordeal, Mr. Shaw was 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 killed. And that's something that, that really you know gets to me every day. I have to live with that every day, knowing that I had the involvement there and I brought them there. And the fatality was because of me. And um, none of this would happen but for your involvement. Do you agree with that? Ma'am? None of this would have happened except for your involvement. Had you not been involved in this, they would have had no idea about Mr. Shaw or any possessions he may have had. Is that correct? That's correct. And so do you acknowledge that even though you didn't actually pull the trigger, you are primarily responsible for what happened in this case? Yes, ma'am, I am. So um, how do you think you know, over the course of the last 24 years as you reflect on this, um, how do you think your actions have impacted the Shaw family? I know, I know it's impacted them terribly. I betrayed everyone by my actions. And I know it's been, I know it's, it's been an impactful on, on, on the whole family. And I now understand the impact that it had on her pregnancy, as well as her daughter's life. I'm now able to understand that. And, and, and that's, that's what deals with me every day. And how do you think your actions have impacted your own family? Drastically, same way. I, I, I betrayed them as well, shamed them as well. How do you think your grandfather felt? I uh, know he, he, he felt horrible. He, he expressed that to me. And I 
All I could do was apologize to him, but he he felt he felt real real terrible about this whole situation. Blame himself? No, ma'am, he didn't. Because I wouldn't allow him to blame himself. You know, I, I took responsibility for that. So let's talk about the last um, 24 years. How are you different today than you were on the day that this terrible crime occurred? Well, I'm, I'm definitely not the same selfish adolescent that I was. I've, you know, bettered myself in many ways. I've educated myself. I've, I've obtained principles and morals about my life now. Now that I've grown and understand what life is about. I just look at everything in a different sense. I noticed that um, you've taken a number of programs, but I'd like for you to talk about the ones that have the most impact on your character. Well, the most the the one that mostly affected me was was victim awareness because it. What it done was it it helped me define the feelings that I was feeling towards Ms. Shaw and the, and the Shaw family when it came to my actions. And Explain I'm, able, I'm, I'm able to emphasize with them now and able to understand that when you lose someone, it's a hurting feeling. And when when you lose someone, it's just, it's, it's, it's terrible, no matter how you lose it, because it's human life. And what victim, victim awareness taught me is, you know, being accountable, being able to look that person in the face and apologize and take responsibility for your actions. So through that class, it really taught me some things that I definitely will, you know, hold for the rest of my life. Are there any other programs that you think um, have benefited you and made you a better person? Compassion cultivation as well. That's another one that 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 touched me in a in a different sense as well. Just being able to, you know, extend wellness to other people, even if you don't know them. Just wishing well for different people's lives and whatever they may be going through. So what have you done to try to, in some small way, make up for the harm that you caused uh, not only the Shaw family, your family and the, the area where you committed this crime. What have you done to try to make amends or give back or some, in some way try to repair the harms caused? Well, my, my actual job that that I do now is part of a, a constructing caskets. And I've made caskets for numerous people as well as the MA population. And my most recent one that I just really made was, was, was real impactful because it was the four year old kid that drowned on a, on a prison ground. So just, just being able to do those things and construct those type of, you know, caskets and, 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 and 
whatever else I may have to do is is really what has you know impacted me and, and allowed me to be the community service or the give back that I can. Are there any other projects or any other activities that uh, you've done that directly uh, benefits uh, either the prison or fellow inmates? Well, yeah, I'll, I'll also, you know, I'm at, I currently live at Camp F and I, you know, help the, the old timers as much as I can as well with different things. And Why do you live at Camp F? Ma'am? Why do you live at Camp F? Because I'm a Class A trustee. And uh, what do you do for a inmate population in Camp F? Well, I, I, I help them whenever they need help. I may cut their hair and things like that. Just however I can accommodate some way. Uh, you went in to prison as a high school dropout. What skills have you acquired that might help you transition into a productive life? Well, I've obtained a electrical degree as well as a graphic communications degree. And the, the, the skill that I'm currently doing now. Okay, as what, a, tell, as tell a me finished, about, go ahead, I'm sorry. As a finished carpenter, a master carpenter, and that sort, that's the my main, you know, focus and trade that I really build on. What is graphics communication? What is that? Well, that deals with, you know, like on the computer, Photoshop and Illustrator and InDesign, you know, making business cards and things of that sort. So graphic design, basically. Yes, ma'am. And um, are you an electrician? Not actually electrician, but I work with. Uh, you have to have electrical when you uh, working with small engines. So I work with that as well, and that's where that electrical certification stem from. Um, I'd like to hear from the warden. Good morning, everybody. Um, I just want to let y'all know that. Big old, the camera. Big old. Uh, I don't like the camera on me though, but it's <laughs> I just want y'all to know that, that Shannon uh, Touche is a very uh, self motivated individual here. Uh, he's very, very uh, intelligent, uh, very uh, respectable to the staff here at uh, Louisiana State Penitentiary. Um, he's highly, he has highly skills in cabinet making. He has helped re uh, restore Jetson for the women when the women were moved there to, uh, to due to the flood. He also uh, built caskets. He also built a casket for Billy Graham and his wife. He uh, did caskets for the former governor, Edwards Edwards. He also did the offender population. And he also did, as he spoke, the four-year-old kid that tragically lost his life here on the grounds of Angola. Um, and he also worked at the governor's mansion, helped set up things there. So he's very trustworthy here. Um, I think that he do, he do deserve a, ch a second chance. And I think if he was to get out there in the community, he would do the right thing and he would help the community. He helped the inmates during the rodeo with their uh, hobby crafts and stuff, uh, making sure that the guys in camp have, have everything that they need. Um, is the older population that lives in Camp F. So, uh, like he say, he makes sure that he helped them get their uh, haircut and everything else. Um, so, I mean, there's nothing that I can say uh, to harm this young man. This young man has uh, exemplified his rehabilitative skills here since he's been here. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Tuesday. 
Yes, ma'am. Let's talk just a little bit about the disciplinary record. You've had uh, over 24 years, you only had uh, 18, which is That's pretty right. less than one a year. But I did see that on March 31st of 2021, you had a write up for contra. Uh, That's right. Tell us about that. Well, it was a, a music player that I had, who I had extra music added to it and games and movies. And uh, when they found it, I took immediate responsibility for it and lost my trustee status for 90 days, did my punishment. But but to be honest with you, I needed that. I needed that as a, as a reality check to really understand that no matter what type of violation, a violation is a violation, whether big or small. And if ever given the opportunity in society, I got to understand that a small violation is not just a pass. You know, you have to abide by what's right and what to do. And again, that's why I say I needed that. That was that was really a, a, a real reality check for me. If you were to be successful today. Mm -hmm. Tell us what your transition plan would be. Well, first I'm gonna go to the parole project and get everything that, that I possibly can from them. And then I would transition to Lake Charles with my wife and take the skills and the trades that I have and begin working out there with Simon Construction. And uh, this crime happened in? In Youngsville. How far is that from Lake Charles? Like about an hour or so. Where did your family live? Sulphur in Lake Charles. And you were only in Youngsville because you were working with your grandfather, is that correct? That's correct. All right. Um, that's all I have with you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Uh, thank you, Ma uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Mr. Tukia. How are you? I'm well, and you? Good, thank you for asking. I'm well. Mr. Tuchet, I just reviewed your annual institutional report dated January 3rd, 2023, only a couple of months ago, and made the comment that you have no organizational participation at all. Why haven't you participated in organization. Today we're looking for rehabilitation and maturity. And part of that maturity is getting along and interacting with individuals. And as far as I can see, you have no active participation in organization where you interact with individuals on a regular basis. Yes, well, my main organization would be the, the job that I'm currently doing, which I interact with numerous people, as well as the, the, the church I'm involved with before gospel. I was in, involved with that as well. But, there, but there's multiple organizations, the veteran organization, the life association, there's so many organizations that you could participate in, but you didn't. Well, Mr. Rocher, uh, currently where I'm living, they don't have those organizations back there. Yeah, can't be Yes, sir. Now, tell me about your community service. Uh, what kind of community service have you rendered 
in the last 24 years, like Earth Lookout Project, hospice, or any other community service that you've done in the last 24 years? Well, my actual community service is what I do now, making the caskets, making the cabinets for those houses that's on the prison ground, as well as all other finished work. That's also your job assignment, am I correct? Yes, sir. So you don't do anything on a volunteer permit basis? Yeah, well, I also do voluntary jobs, like when I'm off at certain houses, if they want something, things done or whatever, I do those as well. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Touche. Thank Mr. Roche, you. Thank uh, you. If I can, yeah. uh, if I can interject. Um, Thanks for all in, Bo. So, Mr. Touche is, is considered a uh, class A trustee. He's uh, able to go off the uh, grounds. The last couple of years, we have been doing a lot of projects with the governor's mansion and also with Jackson Correctional. So that would take him away from the institution a lot where he won't be able to participate in any of the clubs and stuff. So, but he do participate when he get back, you know, he helped the guys in Camp F, like I mentioned to Judge Jackson. So just letting you know that he does a lot of projects that are take him away from the institution also. It's, it's work related, but it's not work. It's volunteer. He volunteers. It's, 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 it's I guess you could say it's work related, but it still takes him away. It's something that he's is he's mandated to do. So I mean, it's not like he can't say no to us. I, I guess. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mark, for your comments, Mr. Roche. Thank you for your comments. Now we're here from for your supporters. Uh, we'll hear from uh, Miss Shakiba Touche. Good morning, Ms. Touche. If you would please give us your name and just tell us what you'd like us to know, please. Okay. Good morning. My name is Shakita Touche, and I come before you today on behalf of my husband, Shannon Touche. I have had the benefit of knowing Shannon prior to his incarceration and to knowing the, the, the man he's become today. Shannon and I met in high school as teenagers, and you know, a time when we were both delegates in our youth. We spent time, you know, talking on the phone, um, hanging out at each other's houses. Um, I have always felt that she preferred to, you know, hang out with his friends more, um, run the streets, as you would say. And, you know, I left feeling hurt sometimes and disappointed in him and upset. But, you know, looking back, I realized that, you know, we were both young and immature and, you know, we couldn't give each other that we that I desire. But I stand before you today to say that the man that he is today is a young boy that I respect. And, you know, Shannon has matured so much. You know, he's a respectable, responsible, honorable um, adult now. I've spoken with people, you know, that are inside the prison that are free people people that are inmates there and they all spoke well of Shannon. Um, you know, what I admire about Shannon is that since the beginning, he's always been transparent with me. He spoke about the crime. He's acknowledged his role, his deep regret in the incident that took place. And he always said that I wish that it would never have happened. He realizes that it has impacted him, the victim's family, and how it's changed the history of his life and the victim's family. And he's always said that, you know, wonder what kind of man he would become if this would have, wouldn't have happened. But I believe that, you know, this incident has allowed God to shape and mold him into the man that he has become today. Um, I've always felt that Shannon was a good person with good intentions, and I wanted to be with him then. But now, even more so, seeing that he is a great husband to me, we reconnected over six years ago, and I've just seen how much wisdom he has now. He's very attentive. 
He's patient. He's caring. I have a young daughter. He's very um, attentive to her needs. Um, he shows care for her. You know, um, one thing that I admire so much about him is that when we reconnected, he never was on the receiving end. He never looked for me to, you know, give to him. But he all, he's always made sacrifices to, you know, do for us. And I appreciated that. Um, he has put his hands to our so many positive things while in this circumstance. And that shows a lot of strength that he has. And it's a testament, his accomplishments is a testament to his growth mentally, spiritually, and physically. This opportunity for parole would give him a chance to show the positive changes he's made in his life and how it would greatly impact others possibly going in the wrong direction. I've worked in the education system for the last 13 years, the last 10 years being a classroom teacher. I particularly work in Title I schools where I believe there's a lot of who are faced with difficult, challenging, dangerous situations. And within the last two years, I've worked in an alternative setting for children who are not able to conduct themselves properly in a regular setting. And I believe that I can, if Shannon had this opportunity that I can connect him with people and uh, programs that help support restorative approaches for children that are at risk. And um, I know that this is a desire for him, and I'm willing to help him do that. And I, and I pray and hope that you would consider it today. Thank you. Thank Thank you very much, Ms. Touche. And we'll now hear from uh, Ms. Jeanette Dodson. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. My name is Jeanette Dawson. And on behalf of my son, Shannon Chuchi, I am his mother. Shannon is my oldest child out of four. Shannon's father was not in his life and still remains absent. My father was Shannon's role model. Their relationship was infectious. Sadly, he is no longer with us. When Shannon was arrested, my family was devastated, not only my family, but the victim's family, because we knew them. Shannon would write me sweet letters saying how much he loved me and always was remorseful and apologized for what happened. Shannon's remarks to the family by writing Two letters. He also had a hearing in July that I attended and witnessed him give a face to face victim's wife being remorseful and apologized. The judge told the court he was remorseful. Shannon's maturity and re rehabilitation started at Angola. He received his GED, four trades. He was baptized and put closer to God. He made Bible covers, coffins, belts, purses, and moved forward into the woodwork. Shannon's support system is very strong. His, he has a wife that is highly educated, a highly educated school teacher with a strong Christian background. She is his mentor. He has all of us that has supported him in these last 25 years. Shannon is so ambitious and strong, loving, caring, loyal, talented, educated, funny, and he loves life. I'm proud to be Shannon's mom. Shannon, Missed and loved by so many. If Shannon is granted, he would be an educated and talented adult in society. And we pray he gets a second chance at life. Sincerely, Shannon. Thank you very much. Now, 
Uh, I see Mr. Kerry Myers is on the uh, Zoom, but I don't see him on the list to speak. Mr. Myers, uh, are you here simply to observe and uh, to show support of the Louisiana Parole Project? Yes, sir. Mr. Touche is a client of Parole Project, um, and we are uh, here in case the board hasn't had any questions or has any questions regarding his transition. Uh, but he is our client, and he will come to our program should he be granted. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Thomas, I didn't recognize you at first when you walked in. Uh, uh, it's customary for you to speak after your after the hearing and your client has his say, but you can speak whenever you wish. Uh, I can speak at the end, Judge. Okay. Good to see you. We'll now hear from the opposition, uh, Ms. Rosanna Shaw. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I stand right here in front of you. My, my legs are trembling. I'm so sorry. Uh, by myself. Always by myself because of Shannon to share his uh, actions. They took the life of my late husband. Uh, my husband and I we were, I was recently got pregnant. That was, it took seven years. We were all of our lives. He was successful in his business. The house. We were building the house. I was pregnant. Everything was beautiful from the top of the mountain. And because these young teenagers had the idea of coming rob the money that my husband so hard work bring I was moving back then. And he says they came to rob, but he brought his friends with guns. What happens when you have guns? Somebody's gonna get hurt. My my husband lost his life right in front of me. I had to through my pregnancy, I almost lost my daughter twice because of the pain. My life changed completely because of Shannon Stuchet's actions. I'm glad he has been doing all those things at, at prison and getting better. But my husband doesn't have that opportunity. He has been gone. Shannon Stuchet had the opportunity to do this and to learn and to prosper. I mean, Miraculously changed. My husband did. He died. He's gone. And I've been having to do life by myself. My daughter suffers uh, depression, and that put her in the hospital several times because the way her dad died. I mean, the judge, when we were at the hearing, <laughs> said that he lost everything because of his decisions. He has the opportunity to do so many things. My husband doesn't. And I have to do life and go through it with all the problems that came around because of his decisions. He opened the, the door. People to sue me, read, read all over, all around me. People wanting when my husband had, and I had to defend myself and just use my resources to defend myself because he let me wide open alone. I just don't think it's fair that he has all these opportunities and even the opportunity of her to go make a beautiful life. She's so talented, she changed. Do that from jail. He didn't do good from jail. Now, my husband can't. He's gone. And I had to leave. I had to keep on living like this. I had to take care of our stuff and, and my daughter and live with the pain. And listening to all of this is it, it, just not fair. He Sections caused my husband to die. Yes, he was, he was a young teenager. That doesn't excuse him from what they did. I lost the beautiful life that I had because of him. Now I pray, I pray that y'all hear me today 
that you all consider my decision and don't run him from Thank you very much, Michelle. We appreciate your comments. Um, Kimberly Vetevi. Uh, Judge, uh, my name is Alan Haney. My card was in. Hey, how yeah, are you? I'm good. Um, and and I'm, I'm an ADA. I think it meant to be B. As okay. Okay. Is that okay. Well, we certainly will substitute yes. you. Yes. Um, again, my name is Alan Haney. I'm an assistant DA in Lafayette Parish. Um, I was the assistant DA for the bill hearing. I guess the first thing I'll ask, I don't know if y'all y'all were privy to the transcript of the bill hearing. I don't know if y'all have it. Um, because I think there's some discrepancies in what you've heard today and in, in what this institution is doing. And, um, you know, I think it would be important, uh, even if y'all delay your decision, get an opportunity to transcript. Because I think, you know, I think it would be important to, to, to Fair and contrast. So I would suggest that if you don't have that, to, to uh, certainly my office can send a copy of that as you want. Um, you know, if, I, if there are some discrepancies that you'd like to point out, yes, feel free to well, and, and you know, look, I'm gonna be working on memory. Okay, so so uh, you know, and I think uh, judges up there, obviously, the transcript would be a better, uh, could could be better than my memory, but but certainly, um, you know. One of the one of the big issues that that was made you know, that I made in the middle of hearing was about responsibility. I think that uh, is when it comes to a parole hearing, when it comes to the Miller Montgomery hearing, one of the most important things is about responsibility. Um, and you know, my memory is that there was some equivocation about what he was responsible for. Um, you know, and 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 I know that Ms. Shaw, and you know, and I, I speak for her. I, I speak for the citizens of Slavia Barry. You know, this is a situation where, and, and Judge Jackson, I think you, you hit the nail on the head that, that we would not be here today uh, with, without the absence of this um, and, and, you know, I, I asked him a lot of funny questions about that. And, and you know, my recollection and my impression was that he's willing to take responsibility that he was there to do a, 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 a rock, but that he, he's not really willing to, to take responsibility for what happened. Okay, I don't think that goes far. And I think that's an important thing that you all should take, you know, to take. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I think that every rule from now until the institution that dies is going to deny his rule. I recognize that. Look, at some point, you know, Miller and Montgomery is the law of the land. You know, he is he is parole eligible. I'm telling you this. Now is not. Now is not. I don't think. That he is there. Okay. And and Ms. Shaw, uh, you know, look, you know, it's it's the circumstances that we're in right now that, that she is going to have to come, probably, if even if you don't ran it, you have to come multiple times to do this. And that's not fair to her, but that's the circumstances that um, you know, I, I think the other part, the other part of the story that I don't think you're getting is, is that you know, whenever the police they discovered Shaw discovered the murder. Um, they, they, they questioned the institution, denied him, and he did. Um, he was not up front with him from the beginning. Uh, what, um, you know, I think those are all things that I think that you should consider. I certainly think you should consider. I'm not going to sit here and, and um, you know, bash the young man for what he's done in prison. I mean, he has. But this is about more than just that. It's oddly, you know, I believe that having true remorse for what he did. I think he has remorse for a robbery. I truly do not believe he has remorse the murder that he And And the other part that, that I think has been left out is, is that, you know, Ms. Shaw, uh, Ms. Rosanna, and her husband, they had come back from the group. Um, Ronald Benson and uh, and the other group defendant, they come out and, and they just shoot. They shoot him right in front of him. Um, they try to, you know, make her go and get the keys out of the, the, out of the, out of his pockets to him. But I guess I don't, I think maybe, and maybe it was in your packet because I know you get some facts. Is what they did do is they took her inside and locked her in the box. She had to beg for her life. She was pregnant. I mean, there, there's a, there's a kidnapping. You all are 
you know, judges here. There's a kidnapping here, and, and it was never really prosecuted because we had a murder. But but there's more than just murder that happened. You know, there is extremely traumatic as it that happened for Miss Shaw witnessing her own husband being killed and then being kidnapped lots of time in her own home. Scared, pregnant, almost lost the age once. And I think the seriousness of that and the lack of true remorse for what he did, I don't think it's fair. And that and that's what I'm here to say. Maybe it'll get there. Not Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haney. We appreciate your comments. Uh, Touche, is there anything you'd like to say before we let uh, Mr. Thomas close it out for us? Yes, sir. I want to say that I, I perfectly understand that I, I altered lives and I take full responsibility for my actions. And I want to apologize to Ms. Rosanna Shaw and the Shaw family, as well as the community, law enforcement, my family, and everyone that was involved in this horrible, horrific crime. I mean, I can't redo what happened, but I regret it, I hate it, and that's not who I am. And I just pray that one day Ms. Rosanna does find it in her heart to forgive me. If not today, one day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tucho. Mr. Thomas, uh, would you like to close us out, please? Sure. If you would, just introduce yourself uh, for the record and uh, let us know what you'd like to say. Uh, Jackson, you want to um, I think what I, I really want to drive home today is just how the of taking accountability for this offense has been. Um, he really has for the last 25 years been absolutely consistent to take accountability for what happened. Uh, Mr. Haney is correct pointing out that the first time Shannon spoke to him, um, he gave a false story. The second time Shannon spoke to him, he confessed what happened. And the substance of that confession um, is the same as every single instance that, that Shannon has had from them to him. Um, so while he was incarcerated pre trial, he wrote a letter of apology to Mr. Shaw and her family. Um, at Ronald Benson's trial, he testified against Ronald Benson explained what happened in this case. Um, no plea deal, no agreement as to sentencing. Um, and ultimately, uh, Reginald uh, Seal pled guilty as a result of seeing the results of Benson's trial. And Shannon's testimony at Benson's trial was read into the record at his own trial, um, which secured his conviction. Um, he ultimately did not receive any sentencing benefits, uh, or see offered from uh, his choice to testify against Benson and testify against himself um, and received the same sentence as he took his vote. Um, he's written additional letters of apology um, during the prison. Um, and he also apologized and testified again about the fact of what happened at the sentencing proceeding. Um, and that's again what we saw here today. Uh, I, I'm personally not sure what discrepancy is being referring to. Uh, I don't believe the transcripts are prepared yet at this point. Um, would like to see that. I'm certainly happy to provide it if that's possible because my, my experience of this touche is that every step of the way, in every transcript I've ever reviewed, every letter, Every word that's come out of his mouth, he's been absolutely consistent in taking a shot for what happened. Um, Judge Jackson, I, I think when you asked Mr. Couche whether this event would have happened without his involvement, he was unequivocal. He was very clear. No, he was not. Um, this was originally Shannon, Shannon led them to where this happened, and it was his fault that this happened, but he has an understanding. Um, 
at the sentencing hearing when she was reading her ruling, Judge Castle said something that I think was kind of illuminating for me, which is she's constantly telling people at the judge that if you really are remorseful about what happened in your case, the way that you can prove that is by conducting yourself properly in prison and working yourself. And that's how she judged the sincerity of the person. It's a hard thing to do um, from a judge's perspective. It's, it's to parse real apologies from the insincere ones. Um, and I think the person's daily actions, like Judge Castle said, are the best indicator of whether they really do feel they have a debt that they owe, um, and whether they're actually willing to work to um, we've heard certainly about Chan's accomplishments and what he's been able to do over the past 24 years. Um, he's worked very hard on his education, uh, he's taken some improvement classes, um, and then outside of his formal work assignments, his willingness to help other people, to mentor other people. I, I cannot tell you how many of my own clients um, know Mr. Touche and have received advice from him. How to handle himself in prison. Um, is a very stoic person and a very modest person. It's hard to get him to talk about his accomplishments and talk about, especially about the um, You know, he doesn't see it as unusual um, to be a mentor. He may not even see these relationships as mentorship. Um, but everybody that I speak to at his own and does. Um, I do just want to reemphasize the disciplinary history again. Um, Shannon has never received a write up for drugs, and he has never received a write up for any violent or play right of course, for 24 years and eight months. Sexual write ups. Essentially, nothing that Shannon has done in prison is inside the world, and he has never done anything in prison harm. Um, so both before this incident and after, Chan has never been involved in violence. This is, this is a one-time horrible decision that he has been able to avoid any semblance of a type of sentence. Um, Shannon has, I think, a, a, the last testament to, to Shannon's character is the people that he surrounded himself with. Um, he both has a wonderful family that he was lucky to come into, but he's also attracted a lot of them people in his life, his friends, his wife, um, the people that I've met through learning about Shannon and investigating his case are people that can be trusted um, as a support system for when he's released. He's not going back to the back and down and hurt him to commit crimes. He's going back to a bunch of people who are encouraging him to work, go to church, stay in the house. That, that is what they are about, and that's what she um, So he has proven over and over again that he's a solid rules, and I think more importantly, he's proven over and over again that he feels horrible, he feels deeply sorry for what he did. Um, and I hope that that's a jump. So uh, thank you for it. And, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thomas. I'd like to move for executive yeah. session. There is second uh, for executive session. Why don't you call the road, please, if you would. Tony Marabella? Yes. Bonnie Jackson? Yes. Allie Brown? Yes. There has been a motion and a, uh, a vote uh, to move into executive session to discuss matters of confidential nature. We will be at a short recess. We will return uh, momentarily with our decision. Wow. So I wonder if they're going to look, try to look at the transcripts that the assistant DA mentioned before making a decision. I have to tell you, it's, it's on one hand really great to see that the assistant DA shows up for this especially that they're both in the same room together, the, the victim and, and the assistant DA. But really a disservice, in my opinion, to show up so ill-prepared. I mean, one thing 
to ask the board to postpone a decision, which is something that they've never done, frankly, that I'm aware of. So to make a request that is not normal practice or maybe even an option is it seems just a rookie mistake and then not to show up with the transcripts available or at least notes on it he he ends up really just kind of rambling on now what we do have and thank you richard for providing this in advance of this hearing we do have some notes on it that I'll go over after. And um, when they come back, we'll review it. But let's, you know, I, I, I do you think that they're going to grant? It's 24 years. I don't know. Um, but we'll go over the details more after. Let's let me f fast forward the this. But this ends up being, I think, a pretty long executive session compared comparatively to others. Okay, here we go. Committee on parole is called back to order. Uh, I think the panel is ready to vote. Uh, Ms. Jackson. Uh, first, let me start by saying that uh, for the sake of transparency, executive session is in a lot of ways like the jury deliberating, sharing our thoughts and ideas with one another. So I never want anyone to think that there's anything other than us needing to discuss our thoughts and opinions among our so, always to be transparent. I would also like to say um, that this is a very difficult case. It is extremely difficult. And as most of these kinds of cases are, it's been terrible loss. There's terrible grief and pain that we see, and it's still present. And I certainly did hear you, Ms. Shaw. And I do know that this is very real for you and it's still very painful for you. And I appreciate your being here. I appreciate your giving us your perspective because that does help us in our decision. Um, our role uh, is not to retry the case. Uh, our role is to evaluate the person who sits before us today and to determine whether or not that person has demonstrated uh, a genuine degree of uh, maturity and remorse and acceptance of responsibility, how that person has conducted themselves over their term of incarceration, uh, to determine whether or not we feel comfortable that release of that person uh, is the right thing to do and it doesn't pose any future harm to other potential victims. One of the things that I think it's important to understand in this kind of case is that this crime was committed when um, Mr. Touche was 17 years old. He has literally grown up in prison. And you judge a person by how they respond in that situation. A lot of people who go into prison at that age, we see a whole lot of disciplinary issues. We see a lot of defiance. We see a lot of uh, just not uh, taking anything seriously, not caring very much about the situation. But we don't see that in Mr. Chichette's case. 
SPE had worked very hard over the last almost 25 years to become a productive human being. I think his expression of remorse and regret for the harm he's caused is genuine. And I believe that he has done what he has been able to do to in some way make amends for the harm. Certainly it does not make up for what he suffered. But he has done what he could do uh, to give back to others and be a productive member. Uh, the judge who uh, presided over the Miller hearing, uh, after having heard everything, her comments was that she believes that he would be a good candidate for release. That's what she uh, said in her statement in pre parole uh, hearing or investigation that after having considered everything, her feeling was that he is a good candidate for police. He has a good support system. There are very positive remarks from prison officials. And I believe that today, Mr. Tuchet has demonstrated a degree of rehabilitation and growth and maturity that makes me comfortable saying uh, that I would vote grant his parole request. So that's my vote. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jackson. Mr. Roche. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to thank uh, Ms. Shaw just having the courage to be present today to tell her story. I've read the letter that you submitted, but I appreciate you appearing in person and it took a lot of courage to come today. And I want to thank you. And I guess Mr. Haney said it uh, better than anyone. As a parole board member, I'm proud of a certain responsibility. And in Miller and Graham cases, where I have juvenile lifers who committed non-murder and murder cases, I am instructed by the courts to look for maturity and rehabilitation. And I see that in this Touche. And He's disciplinary record is um, not bad at all. I, I had concerns about his disciplinary write up in 2021, but it was for having recorded music on a device. Uh, it wasn't a cell phone, it wasn't intoxication, it wasn't a a 21E, it, it was trivial. And the last right up before that was almost five years ago. The last right up before that was almost 10 years ago. Uh, he's taking good programs. He has multiple vocational skills. And the courts have also instructed that in the case of a juvenile lifer, express opposition if that is the only reason we can't deny someone because of express opposition. We have to see immaturity and a lack of rehabilitation. I do not see that today. Therefore, for the same reason, I'm going to grant his release. I'm going to put some conditions on that release. I uh, should have curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Maintain full-time employment and have no contact with the victim's family. 
no contact with the victim's families. If you happen to see a member of that victim's family in a Walmart store and you're at the counter checking out, leave your merchandise at the counter and vacate that space immediately. No, no contact whatsoever with the victim's family. Mr. Kuchet, do you understand that? Yes, sir. Chairman, thank you, Mr. Rushek. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who appeared here today. As Judge Jackson pointed out, this is a very difficult case. All of these cases, uh, as much as we want to empathize, victim, we can't understand the pain that Shaw and suffered as a result. Of this. Uh, it was a horrible crime. Uh, but our role is a different role than a trial of fact. Our role is, as Judge Jackson just pointed out, uh, to determine uh, who Mr. Touche is today and what he's accomplished. Based upon the warden's comments, based upon Judge Jackson's comments, I mean Judge uh, Castle's comments, based upon the work that Mr. Touche has done, uh, his disciplinary history, his work, his support he has, uh, my vote likewise would be to grant his parole. Uh, I would add uh, two conditions uh, to his parole that Mr. Uh, Roche added, one of which is that he uh, enroll in the Louisiana Parole Project and, and uh, work with them. Uh, I'd also like him to get a substance abuse evaluation and follow any treatment that they might recommend. And I'd like to see him do six hours of community service, his fiance indicated that she works with you. And I think that that is something that certainly Mr. Touche uh, would be able to assist her in and would be very valuable to the community. So Mr. Touche, you have three votes to grant your parole. Your parole is granted today with conditions as we have outlined. Good luck to you. Ladies thank and you. gentlemen, thank you very much all for participating here today. Mr. Haney, it's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Six hours of love. Meanwhile, through that, I don't know if you heard it, um, but with headphones on, I heard um, the widow, the victim, the woman who saw her husband murdered in front of her. I heard her crying. I believe it was her. So through that, you hear crying. I, I mean, I, I, I guess it's not fair to assume it was her, but I think it was. Who else would it be? You know, We'll go over the transcripts. The way that Mr. Roche laid it out, I mean, that these are the rules. This is the law, right? It was a, a juvenile lifer. The court instructs them to make their ruling based on based on on what they've accomplished in prison, and it's not based on on if it's simply or purely or exclusively victim opposition and to follow the rules, you know, but this is the facts because I know that it was brought, it was brought up and by the, by the assistant DA, which again, I think it's great that the assistant DA showed up. We've seen so many cases where they just don't think it's important, but to show up without, Again, as I mentioned, by asking the parole board to do something they will not do, which is to make a decision at a later date, and to show up without having notes, or you know, with making a statement without any without any way of backing it up, is just highly unprofessional. 
and you're not doing the victim a favor. How much time did you actually invest into this, or did he just show up? It seemed to me like he just showed up. He 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 when when it, when he went to when the board offered him an opportunity to say where he was being dishonest, he he couldn't. He couldn't. And I couldn't find anything either that showed that he was being dishonest. But it, what happened was, for the whole story, is that he worked for his grandfather who had a construction business. His grandfather built this house, and he was in the house helping build it for the couple that would later move in. And in the house, they built a safe. So he knew that the safe existed. And so it was his idea with his knowledge to go to this house and get the money in that safe. So it, it and that's pretty intense. Uh, and you got to feel so bad for his grandfather and it's, and that's how he got involved. He didn't pull the trigger, but he, like they said at the beginning, without him, none of this would happen. So on March, 18th, 1998, Shannon Touche, what, what a name, huh? Ronald Benson and Reginald Basil borrowed their friend Nicholas Dominic's car and drove from Lake Charles to a newly constructed home of Ronald and Rosanna Shaw in Youngsville with the intent to rob the Shaws. The defendant, Shannon Touche, had worked on the construction site. He shared information regarding the victim's wealth with Benson and Basil. The three men planned the robbery approximately two weeks before it was carried out, and the plan involved the possible murder of Ronnie Shaw. Now, here, here's the part that I guess you could consider um, where he wasn't being honest, but if the plan involved, if it, the possible murder, you know, where this quote comes from and the context behind it, it's, it's, it's not clear in this report. And I'll include the link in the description below. On the night of the robbery, the three men left Lake Charles with a bag containing two loaded guns belonging to Benson and Basil. So the guns were not, he didn't own any of them, right? Um, three ski masks. The plan was for the defendant, the plan was that the defendant was to stay outside while Benson and Basil went inside the house to get the money. The three men hid behind the garage and when the Shaws returned home, grocery shopping they were confronted outside their home by the three masked men benson approached mr shaw whose arms were full of grocery bags and shot him twice so what cowards these punks are complete cowards he he comes home with his wife his hands are full of groceries he's no threat and he just shoots him that was sick and then they get the third shot the execution shot Basil then shot him once more, and then they ordered his wife at gunpoint to take her husband's keys. So now she's pregnant. She's in shock. Her husband's literally murdered. They have ski masks on. They say, "Get you. she is going to go through her husband's pockets, her dead husband's pockets, or dying. She then opened the door and entered the house. She was taken at gunpoint to the closet in the master bedroom and was ordered to open the safe located there. And this is the safe that, that Mr. Touche knew about. After, she, uh, after the contents of the safe were removed, Mrs. Shaw was led to the kitchen where she had to beg for her life. The assistant DA mentioned that part. So she had to beg for her life because, yeah, you would assume they would have killed her. Why, why wouldn't they? They just killed her husband for no reason. Now, they did spear her, which, not you know, I don't know what, I guess because of that, you know, they didn't get the death sentence. She was then locked in an area in the bathroom, the toilet closet, and the assailant left. According to the defendant, the statement, when Basil and Benson entered the house with Mrs. Shaw, he ran and got the car. So according to the defendant's statement, when Basil and Benson entered the house with Mrs. Shaw, he ran and got the car, which had been parked a distance away. The defendant admitted receiving about three or four hundred dollars of the five thousand taken from the Shaw's home. He got three or four hundred bucks. Now, of the three or four thousand of the of the 
the five okay of the five thousand dollars taken from the home so they did all of this for five grand in 1998 i don't know what is that worth like 20 and then he got a few hundred bucks now the one thing that it could show is that the fact that he only got a few hundred could make you believe that he was definitely he was not like the guy that's in charge right You know, if they didn't split it evenly, he didn't get thousands. They basically said, here's a few inch of bucks. Uh, he didn't pull the trigger. Did he know that they were going to pull the trigger? And, um, and again, without him having them go there, it's, uh, it wouldn't have happened. But he didn't, he didn't go inside the house. I mean, you know, in my opinion, again, he, he doesn't seem... To be just you know, it seems like he's could have been more of a follower than a they basically go through the different motions that he did on, on his appeal that were of course all denied. But that was the facts of the case. So Again, and then there was something else. Again, thank you, Richard, for um, for sharing this. But it's basically it's mentioned, and maybe maybe you've read the book, Ronald Shaw Mansion and Murder Victim Book and Stores and Online Now. So it's called Forensic Files. So they ha they go through the story of this in that that book. I'll put the link in the description. And here it is, instead of making a grandpa proud, one of the boys, Shannon Scott, 17, used a blueprint of the Shaw's house as a roadmap for the robbery plan. He told his buddies about a safe installed in the bathroom closet of the new house. On March 18, 1998, after Ronald was on a turn from the supermarket, three young males in ski masks suddenly appeared behind their house just outside the front door, who was holding two bags. Then two males took Rosanna to the house, here it says that they took seven thousand dollars, not five, and a box of jewelry. So It seems that he was being honest, so I'm not sure what the assistant DA was referring to. And again, you know, to come unprepared, it's just, it, it makes me question, you know, how, how seriously are you taking your job? There's one thing to show up, but just, but just take notes, take, take half an hour before you show up and, and review it. So you're prepared to make a statement. You can't just say something. Um, how, how do you feel about this? How do I feel about this? Well, I gotta tell you the, 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 the idea that it's so terrifying. It's a, it's a family that is just the beginning. They built their dream house with this hard earned money. She's pregnant. They're about to start a family and the whole lives ahead of them. And these three punks show up and then they just murder him, which you didn't have to do it. You had masks on. You literally could have just done, you could have done the robbery without murdering him. And it makes no sense. And then you make her grab the keys, go in there and, and then she had to beg for her life. And you can the trauma in her voice and, and her, her daughter, you could see it, it, it like leaked out onto her daughter and, and it, it, it doesn't seem, seem that she's ever, that she's moved on. Like has, she's just dealing with this every day and it's just, it brings it, it brings it home. It's so real that I just have a hard time saying I'm okay with it. Now I get I get the laws and I get everything that Mr. O'Shea and Miss Jackson, Mr. Mirabella said. 
they're ordered by the courts to 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 make a ruling that's based on what he's accomplished, what he's done in prison. If he if he has a chance to reoffend, I I I you know from what I've seen, it doesn't seem like he he it wasn't his guns. He didn't pull the trigger. He didn't go inside the house after it happened. He only got a few hundred dollars. He testified against them in court, didn't get a better sentence of it, and is done and has excelled in prison. And as they said, many kids get in there and they're uh, and they don't do well. And I don't see there is a chance of like I don't see him as someone who would reoffend and um, for someone who hasn't, and you know, again, without it, the, I understand why they, why why they they granted him, and um, what I don't appreciate is what he said. I pray that one day. Miss Rosanna finds it in her heart to forgive me. And it's like, you don't have a right to say that in your final words. You don't have a right to ask anything from her to say, I hope that one day she finds it in her heart to forgive you. I just, it just gets me so, it's like, come on, man. Like, you don't have a right to ask anything from her. She, you don't. She owes you nothing. She doesn't owe you a forgiveness. And don't, you know, and it shows that some disconnection to me that he would ask that. I can't really understand, you know. Well, that's really it. I mean, when it's some, some, when he sum it up, gosh, it's just, his grandfather employed him. He knew there was a safe in there. He assumed they were rich because they built the house. He then told his buddies, "Hey, we, I know where we can get this score." They show up. They murder him in cold blood, and which is so sick, so sick, and. Uh, He didn't pull a trigger. It wasn't his weapon. He didn't go in the house. He only got a few hundred dollars. It's 24 years, basically 25 by the time he gets out. Is that enough? Well, I, I tell you, it's uh, with everything he's done. I, I, we, we have seen people do far worse and get and 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 get out. So, you know, if if you can't keep people locked up forever. It's just I get very emotional when you hear when you hear the victim and, and how, um, but I do. If anyone if anyone would get paroled, I think it would be him. I love to hear your thoughts. With that, I'll let you go.